And if you're a guest with us, welcome to Woodside. We hope you feel right at home on this Easter Sunday. And uh, if you're here today and you uh, don't have a Bible, we really would like to get one into your hands. And there's one at the welcome desk down in the lower foyer after the service. If you could just grab one on the way out, that would be wonderful. And then as well, uh, if you have any questions about the church or any way we can help you, please just stop by the welcome desk. How many of you are alive this morning on this Easter Sunday? Okay. Right? Okay. And I mean that in the physical sense, or I ask that in the physical sense, uh, to remind us we are alive. We are all living, breathing human beings. In fact, today on Easter Sunday, uh, you are going to breathe probably around 22,000 times. Would you join with me if I invite you just a moment to inhale some air, hold it, and then breathe it, breathe out. Okay, ready? One, two, three. And then out. 22,000 times, and we don't really even think about it. And for you, those of you that might have children, they breathe uh, more than that, and then toddlers and uh, newborns even more times per day, more breaths per day. Uh, we breathe uh, on average 22,000 times a day, and we take in or use 8,000 liters of air. Can you imagine you're inhaling 8,000 liters of air? And I was just thinking, if God charged for air like... Uh, we're charged for gasoline, $1.25 a liter, that's $10,000. Uh, that's a lot of money per day. We are living, breathing human beings. If you'd like to live longer, and we are all to be stewards of, of life, God wants us to uh, live uh, and be wise stewards. Uh, that means you need to probably eat some kale and uh, <laughs> go for a walk and get on a treadmill or something, but also... Uh, if you breathe correctly, you'll have a greater chance of living longer. Okay, just a little tip for you there this, this Easter Sunday. Breathe properly. We are told we often breathe with shallow breaths from our upper chest as opposed to those slow, deep breaths from our diaphragm. And the more that we can practice and breathe deeply, it will help us to think better, sleep better, feel better, perform better, uh, they've done studies to show that when we breathe deeply, it reduces uh, anxiety and stress and muscle tension. It decreases high blood pressure. It strengthens our immune system. It eliminates toxins. It helps us to focus more clearly and concentrate. So breathing is a good thing. We are all living, breathing human beings. There's some bad news, though, this morning on this Easter Sunday that I do need to really share with you. There's coming a day for each of us here where we will stop breathing. And when we stop breathing, probably some loved ones, family or friends, will put us in a casket or they'll have us cremated and they'll take the stuff we own, like, well, actually, we don't own it, but they'll take the car we drove or the cottage we owned or the clothes we wear, and they'll donate it or do something with it. And then it gets better. After that, then all of those loved ones, they'll all die, and you will be totally forgotten. So happy Easter. Go home and eat some chocolate. <laughs> and really, that's not a bad idea. Eat chocolate 24-7. You're going to die. Who cares? A guy named Paul 2,000 years ago said, listen, if there's no resurrection from the dead, let us eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. And that's a great way to live, really. Go home, get drunk. Uh, we're going to pass some new laws. You can smoke marijuana, get stoned, do it all the time. Who cares? You're going to die. This morning, as we face death and we pause and we think, I'm going to stop breathing, we need to hear that maybe, just maybe, there's some good news. That maybe somebody was a champion over death. Maybe somebody defeated it. And if you're here and you're not real familiar with Jesus, or maybe you don't, you, 
you know him, but you don't believe he's God and you don't believe he rose from the dead, would you listen along this morning as we look at a story where Jesus comes face to face with death? And from that story, there's something that God wants to do in your life. And from scripture, there's a second thing he wants to do in your life when it comes to your death. God wants to work in your life on this Easter Sunday. So if you have a Bible, I invite you to turn to John chapter 11. And uh, if you don't have one, there's a new Bible in front of you. It's on page 923. And we're going to look at this story recorded by John that took place 2,000 years ago where Jesus comes face to face with death. John chapter 11 and Jesus, uh, John begins. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. If you go to Israel today um, and go to Jerusalem, the holy city, a very old city, I was there not too long ago, and you go up near the area of the Temple Mount, if you look from Jerusalem to your east, Uh, you will see just past the Kidron Valley, the Mount of Olives. And if you go just a little further east, you will come to the village of Bethany. And 2,000 years ago in that village, there were three siblings that that's where they made their home. Martha, Lazarus, and Mary. And Jesus, during his three years where he went around the land of Israel, preaching and teaching and supposedly healing, when he came into Jerusalem, he would often retreat to Bethany, just outside of the city, where he would spend time at the home of uh, Mary and Martha and Lazarus. He loved them. It was a haven for him. Well, one day John records that Lazarus becomes sick. He is, the word there is he's deathly sick. He's about to die. And so Jesus, not being in Bethany at the time, gets word. Mary and Martha send a runner or runners to tell Jesus. Now, Jesus is about uh, 20, 25 miles east of Bethany uh, on the other side of the Jordan River. And he hears the news that Lazarus is about to die. But in the story, Jesus doesn't drop everything and rush to be with Lazarus. There's no red-eye flight home. I mean, we know death, most of us, and if someone's near death, we're hopping on a plane, a train, or an automobile to get home to, you know, for those last words with the loved one. But Jesus doesn't move. He stays for two days where he is. Why? He tells his disciples that it has to do with the glory of God. Well, after two days... Jesus then makes his way towards Bethany. Verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. So it probably took a day, day and a half to get there. Jesus stays two days and then a day, day and a half to get back. Lazarus has already been placed in a tomb for four days. In our culture, in the 21st century, when someone dies, typically we have three or four days and there's a funeral or a memorial service or something like that. In the first century in that area, uh, it was very warm in Palestine. And a body, a dead body, would decompose very quickly. So often a dead body was wrapped and buried on on the same day. And so that's what happened to Lazarus. And in that day, what they would do is they would take spices and ointments and wash the body, and then they would wrap the body from head to toe. So you'd be taped with your arms by your side and your feet uh, together, and you'd be taped like uh, the image of a mummy, right? In cloth, you'd just be like a mummy. Then they would take the dead body and they would put it into, often into a cave, in a tomb. And you can go to Israel today and see caves that date back to that period and actually even before that. And in this cave cut out uh, from uh, a hill, they would place the dead body, either on a ground or on a, uh, on a, on a ledge. Then they would take a stone that, that they had fashioned and they would roll it so the stone would roll and they put it in front of the tomb. 
And then about a year later, uh, the loved ones would go back to the tomb, they'd, they'd have the stone rolled away, they'd go back, and they'd take the bones of the deceased, and then they'd take them and put them into a container called an ossuary, and there they would put them on a shelf uh, in the cave. And uh, you could fit many bodies, uh, dead bodies, inside of a cave. So Jesus makes his way back to Bethany, but Lazarus has already been dead for four days. Verse 18, now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. In that culture, they grieved for seven days. It was formal grief. You stayed at home. Today, when someone dies, uh, we're, we're grieving, uh, but typically we're not confined to our home for seven days. But in that culture, you were in your home for seven days, deep grieving. And we're told that some people had come to Mary and Martha from Jerusalem to comfort them, friends, family. And Jesus meets them in the middle of those seven days. Seven days of formal grief followed by 30 days of light grief. It's right in that heavy, intense time that Jesus comes. Martha, hearing that Jesus is coming, goes out to meet him. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Mary and Martha, I'm sure for those four days, were probably saying, oh, if only Jesus could come and, and save Lazarus, do something to heal him, because Jesus, uh, for throughout the three years, uh, had a reputation. He was known as being able to heal people. Oh, if he'd only come. Well, when Martha finally sees Jesus, she says to him, Lord, if you, if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. She was probably a little passive aggressive, kind of like, I'm blaming you, Jesus, but I'm not really blaming you, but I'm blaming you. But I just, yeah. And I think if we're all honest, we've been there as well. God, if you are a God of love and power, like you've revealed yourself to be, who you say you are, and you can do anything and you love me, then why did I lose a loved one? Why did I lose a marriage? Why did I lose? And we can fill in the blank. And so we ask God the same thing. We tell God the same thing. You could have stopped this from happening. Why am I in this pain? Why am I in this grief? But notice with Martha, even in the midst of her grief, she's still holding on to Jesus. She says, but I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. And she was basically saying, Jesus, I'm still gonna believe in you. I know that you can heal. And, and not thinking of anything that's gonna happen to her brother Lazarus, but she was just like, Lord, I'm still believing in you. Jesus responds to Mary. Verse 23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Martha was an Orthodox Jew, and that minority in the Roman Empire at the time believed that there was a general resurrection of all people at the end of time. In that culture, in that day, or in that uh, time period, there were other beliefs as to what happened when you died uh, as well. And here we are 2,000 years later, and we have all sorts of theories about what happens when we die. Some people believe that there's a general resurrection after we die. Other people believe that when you die, you are reincarnated into another life form. Other people believe that when you die, your spirit or some part of you kind of floats around in the universe or goes somewhere. And then there are other people who believe that when you die, you cease to exist. That's all there is. Eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow. We die. Lord, I know that he will be raised on the last day. And here we look at Jesus' response to Martha. Jesus said to her, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Martha, more than the resurrection being a future event, the resurrection is a person, and you're standing in front of the person. I am the resurrection. I am the life. I'm the source of both. Martha, the one who believes in me will live even though they die. Even though your brother Lazarus has died 
and you will die and Mary will die and people will die, that's not the end. They will live. And Martha, whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Martha, for those that have placed their faith in me, they'll never die. And if you look at scripture, this is not talking, uh, there's three different types of death in scripture. This is not talking about physical death, but this is talking about spiritual death, eternal death. That if your faith is in me, you'll never be separated from God for all eternity. Martha, as you journey through life, as long as you live, I'm your life. And Martha, when you die, I am your resurrection. I'm with you in the present, and I'll be with you in the future. Martha's response to this declaration, verse 26, Jesus asked, do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior, the Deliverer, the Son of God, who Moses and Abraham and David and Isaiah and all of these people talked about that would come into the world to save us. I do believe you're that person. If you're here this morning and you're not real familiar with the Bible, the Bible is not simply a book of ideas and concepts. It's about a person, and that person is rooted in history. His name is Jesus Christ. And the Bible can really be divided into four sections. The story has four parts to it. The first part is creation, where the God who made you and me, who gives us breath, created all things, and he created all things good. He's a good God, and we were made to live forever. We were made to flourish. But the second part of the story is called the fall. We as human beings, given free will, we chose to turn from God and go our own way and do things that do not line up with God. It's called, those, those things are called sin. And because of that sin, we die physically, but also spiritually and eternally. But that's not the end of the story. That's not the end of the movie. The third part, the third section, is redemption. That Jesus, God's son, came into the world so that he could die on our cross for our sins to pay the penalty that we could never pay so that fallen man could be restored to a holy God. And then the fourth part of the story is where Jesus Christ will come again a second time and restore all things. He will right all wrongs, and there will be no more death, mourning, or pain. That's the four parts of the story. And so Martha, didn't know, not knowing as much as we do now, said, Lord, I believe that you're the one talked about earlier in the story. Martha, meeting Jesus and hearing these words from him, then turns from Jesus and goes back to Bethany to, to the house to get Mary, and she says, Mary, Jesus wants to see you. So Mary goes out to meet Jesus, followed by uh, those that were, some of those that were mourning with her in the house, goes out to meet Jesus, and we pick up the story in verse 33. When Jesus saw her weeping, that's Mary, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said to him, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Just earlier in the city of Jerusalem, a man born blind had his sight restored by Jesus. And they, there were some there standing or with, the, with Mary saying, couldn't he have healed Lazarus? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. I love Martha. I mean, she just like, she's got her to-do list. Uh, she's practical. She's, on, she's in control of the situation, a uh, you know, control person. She loves it. And she says to Jesus, you know, in a sense, I know you really want to see him one last time, but 
If we take away the stone, there's going to be a bad odor. As the King James Version translates it, he stinketh. (laughs) He's a decomposed body. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out. His hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Imagine if you are standing around that tomb on that day and Jesus calls Lazarus forth. If there's no movement from the dead man, Jesus embarrasses himself. Jesus really is cruel to Martha and Mary for getting their hopes up. But more importantly, you would stand there looking at a guy who you probably, if you had a little bit of belief, you probably would have stopped believing in him. Sure, he can heal people, but he can't do that. But John records for us, that's not what happened on that day. It says, he said, the dead man came out, wrapped from head to foot in linen, in cloths. How do you think Lazarus came out of the tomb? Okay, he's taped up like this. He's a mummy, right? He didn't walk out. He had to probably, what, hop out, right? Right? And someone has correctly observed that probably the people standing there for the rest of their lives laughed at that moment and at dance parties would say, hey, let's do the Lazarus. (laughs) Did he stumble? Did he fall? We're not told. And notice that Jesus has to say to those standing there, hey, take off his grave clothes. You would think If someone was raised from the dead, you'd be unwrapping him as quick as you can. Why not? Well, it was because he was raised in Canada and it was cold out and they didn't want to take off his grave clothes, right? No, it was a warm climate. Was it because, well, there were laws about touching a dead body? Well, yeah, but when someone comes back from the dead, you don't see that every day. You probably kind of want to trump those laws and just help this guy. Probably... They didn't move because they were stunned, just like you and me would have been. And Jesus says, take off his grave clothes and let him go. Lazarus raised from the dead. Why did Jesus wait two days before going to see Lazarus? It's because he wanted them to get a glimpse of God's glory. He was known as a person who had power, and they had seen his his healing power. But on this occasion, just before he's about to die himself, he wants them to see his resurrection power. He wanted them to see that he is the champion over death, that he has the power over death, that death does not have the last word. It's interesting, if you were to read some documents from the first century, which we we have, uh, there was a Jewish superstition in that day that said uh, when a person died, uh, their spirit hovered over the body for three days, hoping to get back into the body. And if Jesus had gone immediately and got there, you know, within two days of him being buried, then some of those standing there could have said, oh, 
Jesus didn't really raise him from the dead because Lazarus was still alive. For those of you that have seen The Princess Bride, he was what? He, he was just mostly dead. He wasn't dead dead. He was just mostly dead. Jesus just resuscitated him. But Jesus waiting to the fourth day was saying, I'm going to show you resurrection power. And the story that John records for us, where Jesus goes toe-to-toe with death, wants us to see that the resurrection of Lazarus foreshadows the resurrection of Jesus. Shortly after this took place, within a week or seven to eight weeks, we're not sure the exact time frame, Jesus himself would die. He'd be wrapped, he'd be placed in a tomb, and a stone would be rolled in front. But unlike Lazarus, he didn't die from a sudden illness. He died on a Roman cross intentionally. We're told in the story that before the creation of the world, before you and I ever breathed the breath, it was in the eternal mind of God that one day he would send his son into this world to save us from sin. And Jesus on the cross taking care of our sin problem took care of our death problem because he defeated the evil forces that led to our, that leads to our death. And Jesus, just like Lazarus, died. And Jesus, as the story goes, was raised to life as well on the third day. And the resurrection of Lazarus not only foreshadows the death and resurrection of Jesus, but it foreshadows your death and resurrection as well. Two things that God wants to do in your life when it comes to your death. First, he wants to free you from the bonds of death. We're all dead in our sins and our transgressions. We're all separated from God. We're all going to die this eternal death. But there's hope. There's good news. Jesus has overcome the grave, and he can free us from the bonds of death where our penalty has been paid for, our sin, and we can live forever. This morning, if you have never said yes to Jesus like Martha and millions of people down through the ages... Today, you can say yes to Jesus. Today, Jesus is calling all of us out of the cave, out of the cave of sin and shame and defeat and hopelessness and uncertainty and pain. And he's saying, come to me, believe in me. I'm your resurrection. I'm your life. Even though you die, you will live. And as long as you live with me, you've got me for all eternity. You will never die. Is Jesus your resurrection and life? And if you've never said yes to Jesus today, you can simply call out to him. As we sing even now, Jesus, I believe I'm a sinner, and I believe you died on the cross for my sins. Save me. And he will. And he will save you from death. The second thing that God wants to do in your life when it comes to your death is he wants to free you from the fear of it. He wants you to go through life not dreading the fact that you will die. In Hebrews 2, we're told by the writer of Hebrews that Jesus came to free us from the bondage, the slavery of the fear of death that we can go through life knowing that death is not the end of my story, it's not the end of the movie, but rather it's a doorway to life eternal with God. That's why a guy named Paul was able to say, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. To be absent from my body is to be with the Lord, that death is not the end of the story. Do you ever wonder what happened to Lazarus after Jesus raised him? from the dead? Well, we know he died, but what happened? There's uh, two church traditions as to what happened, and I'm not sure if either is true. One is that he eventually made his way from the land of Israel to the island of Cyprus, and uh, he died there about 30 uh, years after 
the time Jesus raised him from the dead. And in fact, if you go to the island of Cyprus today in the city of Larnaca, there is the church of St. Lazarus, which is built over, anybody want to take a guess what it's built over? His tomb, his second tomb. That's one tradition. The other tradition is that Mary, Martha, and Lazarus made their way into Europe, into the area of France, and there uh, Lazarus was beheaded during the reign of Emperor Diocletian. Not sure if either is true. But could you imagine Lazarus living out the rest of his life, the 30 years or so after that, or however long he had? He didn't have to fear death. We're told by John a little later in the story that when this miracle about Lazarus started to get around into Jerusalem, the holy city and other places, that the religious leaders who had been plotting Jesus' death for three years finally said, no, no, we have to do something today. We've got to get rid of him today. We've got to kill him today. And in fact, we need to kill Lazarus because people are believing because of him and what supposedly Jesus did to him. I don't know if Lazarus is in front of those chief priests hearing their threats, but could you imagine? Lazarus, don't you share any more about this fact that you were dead and Jesus you know, rose you from the, uh, raised you from the dead. Do not share that or we will kill you. And what's his response? Been there, done that, I've got the t-shirt. <laughs> sure, go ahead. We're told that the disciples of Jesus, after his death and resurrection, that they went into the world and nothing could stop them. And the message, as you read in the book of Acts about the early church, they went with the message, not that, hey, Jesus is a great teacher and you should you know, try to implement these five principles when it comes to this and you should do this. They went into the world saying he was dead and he is alive. There is forgiveness of sins and there's life in his name and nothing could stop them. Church tradition has it, Thomas died here, Bartholomew died here. The disciples went to their death, proclaiming the good news of the resurrection. And maybe you're here this morning, you would say, wait a second, there's lots of people, even today in the 21st century, who die believing something to be true. And that is, that's correct. But the reality is, those disciples, they knew whether Jesus rose from the dead or not. They weren't hoping that he rose from the dead. They knew one way or the other. And how come all of them would go to their death or stay faithful to Jesus in the midst of threats in the Roman Empire? Because they did not fear death. And when you look at the evidence, it's, it really is overwhelming that Jesus rose from the dead. N.T. Wright, who is a uh, Bible scholar and a historian, he's taught at Cambridge and Oxford and he still speaks around the world today, he writes this, as a historian, I cannot explain the rise of early Christianity unless Jesus rose again, leaving an empty tomb behind him. I cannot explain how this all came about. And if you're here this morning, and all of us are really, we should be kind of skeptical of a resurrection. I don't know, but we haven't seen anybody, I haven't seen anybody raised from the dead after four days. But when I look at the evidence for it, I've got to explain away a lot of things. First, these first followers of Jesus, the disciples. How do I explain how they were faithful to their death? How do I explain how the younger brother of Jesus named James, who thought Jesus was kind of little, you know, didn't have everything, uh, uh, he was skeptic, uh, skeptic. How come in history we know him to be a leader in the church of Jerusalem? And then how do I explain away Paul, who was offended at Jesus and Christians, not simply writing a blog and saying, keep Jesus to yourself, but rather saying, if you mention him, you will be arrested and possibly killed. How do we explain this guy in real history who had this change of heart, of mind? And then we have to explain away, why did the disciples start sharing that Jesus rose from the dead in Jerusalem? If it was a fabrication, you would start it in Rome, somewhere far away where people wouldn't know for sure what happened. And why would you appear to have the story that Jesus would appear to women, women in the first century, 
their witness in the court of law was not valid. If you're making up a story, you'd never put that Jesus appeared first to women. Why did they do that? Well, probably because that's what happened. We have to explain away a lot of things. And this morning, if you're not sure of Jesus, I want to encourage you to get a Bible and to read, and where do I start? Read the Gospel of John, 21 chapters, and read the story of Jesus. There's no fear of death. Howard Hendricks says this, we think we are in the land of the living on our way to the land of the dying. Nothing could be further from the truth. We are in the land of the dying on our way to the land of the living. Anybody want to sing and self pray We're on our way to the land of living. There's two shows that I um, have watched uh, over the years. All the rest of the shows I don't think are worth watching on TV, but uh, most of them. Uh, the first one is Law and Order, the original version, right? Law and Order fans here. And then the second is 24, Jack Bauer. Eight seasons and they made it nine, right? For those of you not familiar with Jack Bauer, he was an agent with the counterterrorism unit. He was like their best agent. And uh, show after show, Jack would go in and, you know, saving us, really, you know, the world from these terrorists, whether it was a bomb that was about to go off or something. And more than once, he'd be in a situation where you thought he was going to die. You know, he'd go in, no backup, and, you know, there's 100 terrorists around, they're going to kill him. And you're like, Jack, you know, don't go, don't go. And he'd go in, right? And I remember uh, watching and, uh, those shows, and my heart would beat a little faster because I was caught up in it, and, and I breathed a little shallower, you know, lots of breaths. And, um, but it hit me one day. And I'm not the only one that knows one and one is two. Other people have realized this as well. But you're thinking, oh, Jack, don't die. And then you realize, I don't forget when it happened, what season it was, but I realized, wait a second. There's already another season planned for 24. They've already signed the, the guy that plays Jack Bauer to a two-year contract or three-year contract. He's not going to die, right? So I could kind of breathe a little deeper, step back, right? All of us here, we get caught up in life, and we find ourselves in pain. We find ourselves sometimes hopeless. We find ourselves sometimes discouraged and uncertain. But knowing Jesus rose from the dead, we get to take a step back and say, wait a second. This is not how my story ends. Sin doesn't have the last word. Pain doesn't have the last word. Death doesn't have the last word. I'm going to live forever with Jesus. He's my resurrection. He's my life. I have more than nine seasons. I have more than 672 million, 786,000 breaths. That's how many you take, if, roughly, how many you take if you live to 80. And if you're past that, way to go. Keep breathing deeply. I get to live longer than that. The resurrection means I'm freed from the bondage of death, but as well, the fear of death. Jesus said that he came to give us life and give it to the full. A life that goes on and on and a life with his peace and joy and his hope. Have you come out of your cave and have you said yes to Jesus? I invite you, if you, uh, invite you now, if you would, to bow your head and uh, if you'd like, and we're gonna pray. Heavenly Father, on this Easter Sunday, we truly, truly have something to celebrate. Whether things are going well or things are not going well. Lord, we thank you for the hope and the future that we have in your Son, Jesus, our risen Savior and Lord. While we have breath, Lord, we pray that you will continue to use us to be on mission with you around the world, restoring things to the way they're supposed to be. Lord, continue to give us a heart for those in need, for the poor, the sick, for the refugee, for different people. Help us to make a difference in the name of your son, Jesus. And then I invite you with your heads bowed, if you are here and you haven't said yes to Jesus, 
Would you say it today? Would you surrender your life to him and say, Jesus, I believe I want you to be my resurrection and my life. Would you do that today? Would you grab a Bible on your way out and, and learn more about the one who died for you? And then if you're here today and you fear death, which is normal, would you confess that to God and say, God, I'm asking you that you would replace that fear with faith. Lord God, you are my resurrection and life. Help me to go through life with your peace. Father, we thank you that your son has risen from the dead. He's been raised victorious. And because of that, we have a hope and a future. We give you thanks in his name. Amen.